there's a kind of a suspicious sort of a chorus in the song. You can join in if you're sure there's no one watching you. Whatever you say, say nothing when you speak about you know what. For if you know who should hear you, you know what you'll get. They'll take you off to you know where, for you wouldn't know how long. So for you know who's sick, don't let anyone hear you singing this song. The sort of words that would ring in your ears when you were growing up in Belfast in the 70s and 80s were, don't speak to this person, don't tell them your, your religion, don't tell them your name, don't tell them anything. Don't get yourself into trouble. There's trouble going on in this city and very soon you can find yourself wrapped up in it. Whatever you say, say nothing. Growing up with that veil, over every, it just was over everything then. Don't speak up about your political rights. Don't speak up about your human rights because that's like civil rights activism and that's what's got us into this trouble. We do sit in a country that is afraid of what might go wrong. And I think that does influence things like moving forward with political agendas that are in any way controversial. When I mention you know who And if you know who could hear me now You know what he do so if you don't see me again, you know why I'm away. But if anyone asks you where I've gone, here's what you must say. It's become part of our culture that we're cautious. And people are really afraid to come forward and tell their story. You know what you'll get. They'll take you off to you know where, for you wouldn't know how. So for you know who's sick, don't let anyone hear you singing this. In December 2015, at 12 weeks pregnant, after seeking a private blood test not available on the NHS in Northern Ireland, my pregnancy tested positive for Edwards syndrome, which is a fatal fetal chromosomal abnormality. When I was older, you know, and I knew there was a higher chance of complications in pregnancy. So I hadn't just quite emotionally committed to what was inside me, because I just, I was just anxious to know that everything was going to be okay. I had a scan, they were querying my dates, and I guess that put a seed of doubt into me because they thought, oh, it's, this looks like it's earlier than what you're saying. And I thought, that means it looks like it's smaller than what it should be. The private consultant called me at work and as soon as he spoke his name I knew it was bad news because he told me he would call personally if the results were urgent. An urgent result meant a bad result. He and a nurse explained the certainty of the test result and the odds of survival which were minimal. They could not formally support any process to terminate the pregnancy even though they were non-judgmental about the option. Essentially, my file was closed. Our decision was clear, but the situation was dire and it was devastating. Being sent home to digest the loss with only a clinic phone number and some urgent travel plans to sort made me feel crucified with shame and anger that I didn't really need to feel at such an acutely traumatic time. And the impact was undeniably and exponentially multiplied due to the legal position in Northern Ireland requiring this farce of travelling out of your comfort zone. It was terribly frightening to know I had to have a general anaesthetic and then board a plane home within a few hours. Where would I convalesce and how would I feel? And the lack of local healthcare provision and these scary plans felt acutely like an abuse of my human rights. It was like a nightmare on top of a nightmare. My elderly parents offered to travel with me the week before Christmas to minimise the disruption for my daughter as her dad stayed at home with her. At the airport we bumped into a friend of my parents and I felt so sorry for my mum as she tried to come up with some cheery tale about why we were heading to Manchester together. My dad, my mum and me off travelling together. How lovely, the friend said. Is 
just this horrible, awkward hanging thing in the air and I thought oh my god what is going to happen here how's this conversation go I think my mom filled in the blanks with something about shopping or something like that I remember just thinking my mum and dad should not have to go through this this is so unfair on them having to meet people having to explain yourself when you can't because you can't you wouldn't you just wouldn't have said everyone knows that it's an emotive issue Everyone knows that it's a choice and to be pro-choice puts you on one side of the fence and to be pro-life puts you on the other side of the fence. We had to sort of make some story about where we're going and why we're here because there's this legal framework that makes it criminal to be in this position. Personally, I never felt like that. I never felt myself to be like a criminal. But I hated that the legal system made me look like maybe I was a criminal. How dare they? Welcome on board this Ryanair flight. May we have your attention while we point out some of the safety features on this Boeing 737-800 aircraft. Please remove headphones during this demonstration. I don't really remember anything about the flight, to be honest. It's as if a lot of my memories have just been buried, which is odd because on the surface of it, I'm fine with what I did, I'm fine that I had to do it, I'm okay with all of it, but it was highly traumatic. So. I'm not surprised that some of those memories, I just can't, I just can't bring that back. I can't recall. Thank you for your attention. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy your flight. We got a taxi straight to the clinic, and it wasn't that far from the airport. in that clinic, feeling upset for the others from Ireland and Northern Ireland, sitting in the saddest queue you can imagine. Most had blank faces as we were shuffled in and out of different waiting areas. It was not a luxurious environment. It was pretty basic. And that just didn't help with the whole experience of feeling like an outlaw, feeling like you're doing something that you're not supposed to be doing, because the law says you shouldn't. There really wasn't even anybody talking. If people were talking, they were whispering. A lot of people there were Irish, so maybe that's why people were whispering as opposed to talking, because they had that sense that I'm, I'm doing something wrong and I mustn't talk about it and a lot of the people there were very young and some of the people there were all on their own. You know, and you just wanted to reach out to people, but you couldn't because it's such a personal journey, you know, and I knew I didn't want any strangers talking to me. I, you know, I had a book because the book is protective, isn't it? It just it means people don't talk to you if you've got your head in the book. I don't remember what the book was and I'm pretty sure I didn't read any of the book. The book was there as a prop <laughs> to keep other people away. The first thing the nurse at the clinic spoke to me was, have you decided what form of contraceptive to use after this? Another affront to a broken-hearted woman carrying a fatal fetal abnormality. I replied telling her this was a very much wanted pregnancy and I wouldn't want any contraception. Then she looked at her notes and proceeded to the mandatory scan. And while she scanned me, she told me about a person she knew whose baby with Edwards syndrome had lived until two years old. I will never understand why she felt the need to tell me that. Why are you giving me that information? Right now, when I'm sitting here waiting to have a termination, that's what the real me wanted to say. I don't remember what I said to her. I just remember thinking, what the fuck? <laughs> Why are you saying that? You insensitive cow.
and then I was passed into the next waiting room. <laughs> there was no windows, I remember that much and thinking, this is odd to sit in a waiting room and no windows, I don't like this very much, this is not very user friendly. And then being called into another room, and that was the actual procedure room. And I do remember people being, you know, are you okay with that? Are you ready for this? And it's like, yes, yes, just do it. God, stop asking me. Yes, I'm ready. Just let's get this done. So I have very, 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 very vague memories of having to put my feet in stirrups and thinking this is hideous. Um, just help me go to sleep, please. I'm ready now. I don't want to know about this anymore. The recovery area was furnished with what seemed like basic sun loungers from Ikea. Weird. A cup of tea and three bourbon biscuits in a plastic wrap. I remember thinking it was all a bit cheap considering the price tag. I wanted toast and butter. That's what they give you in hospital after giving birth. I am a smoker and I've just been through something really traumatic. The first thing I want is a cigarette. <laughs> but they said, don't smoke for a couple of hours. Um, and after I was on the IKEA lounger for recovering for about 20 minutes or half an hour, they said, as soon as you're ready, you can go and put your clothes on and um, go through to the next waiting room. Um, and I remember going outside for a cigarette <laughs> and the staff at the reception came out and said, you're really not supposed to smoke right away. And I said, I know. And they said, OK. And they left me there to finish smoking my cigarette. And when I got up from smoking the cigarette, Jesus, I was really dizzy and it hadn't been a good idea. But there you have it. I mean, I definitely had a sense of, let's get the fuck out of here. This is a horrible place, this horrible clinic. And, and I'm not enjoying being here at all one bit um, because it's just so fucking sad. Everyone is sad who's here. Every step of the way, anything that was unpleasant about it just made me more angry that it had to do it, that it had to go away, going through all those rooms and seeing all those other sad people and feeling awful for them because they didn't have the support they needed and why did they have to go through it as well and why did my mum and dad have to go through it? And I, just Everything was horrible, let's just move along. My parents brought me to the hotel at Manchester Airport. We had about five hours until our flight home. We went into a hotel bar and we had something to eat and I just remember being in really foul form. I wanted a specific meal. I wanted a creamy pasta. I remember thinking like if they didn't have this, there's, I'm going to make a scene. I don't want to make a scene, but I'm just like so wound up. I just want creamy pasta. <laughs> it seems so crazy, but and they did have a creamy pasta dish. It's like, thank fuck for that. I just want that. That's it. It's just comforting food, I suppose. We went to the room and all three of us fell asleep. We were just wrecked, just exhausted. When we lay down to go to sleep, I remember feeling a bit uncomfortable, a bit sore. And I remember feeling like um, I still feel pregnant. I don't want to feel pregnant anymore, but I still feel pregnant. And now that the termination was done, it was like, oh, God, of course. I don't want to feel like that anymore. Um, but I guess it just went away. I don't really remember. The horrible procedure came and went, and the pain came and went, and the plane came and went. I'll never forget how it felt. It was an emotionally exhausting experience, to say the least. I don't remember much about coming home, and I don't remember much about the following weeks, except for occasional tearfulness and plenty of hugs, and it was Christmas, which was a welcome distraction. 
Oddly though, I clearly remember what I wore on that trip and I still think of those soft, comfy baggy trousers as my abortion pants. In the months following the ordeal, I suffered from a major exacerbation of a skin condition. My immune system had collapsed. I felt that I was mentally well and I was emotionally managing the loss of the pregnancy and that part didn't leave me in as much emotional pain as I thought it might. It was really hard, of course. I was 42 and it seemed like our last chance to have another child was probably fading away. In retrospect, I'm sure my physical condition was partly caused by internalising the disappointment and the helplessness of losing a pregnancy, but certainly it was compounded significantly by internalising the rage at the injustice of it all. As a mental health professional, I've since published an article about the impact of withholding human rights, in particular the right to terminate pregnancy. I also shared my story within a range that my husband can accept and feel comfortable with because it's not just me who went through this experience and it's a very private experience. Since the Eighth Amendment was repealed in Ireland, things are undoubtedly worse for the people of Northern Ireland. We are now even more marginalised by this legal mess. While the campaigning and the change is welcomed, it's also re-traumatising many of us who've travelled for terminations. My human rights have been violated and so have thousands of others and many more continue to be violated every day, week and month that this goes on. It's inhumane. It breaks my heart. It's my choice as a pregnant person to terminate a pregnancy for any deeply personal and private reason. I tell my story to ensure this human right is extended to people based in Northern Ireland. We need to remove the imposition of unwarranted shame of being banished and abandoned. Our little soul is peaceful in the stars and someday we might be reunited. I hope I can tell him or her that things have changed and that he, she made a difference with that short existence as a tiny broken fetus. Well, that's enough about so-and-so, not to mention such-and-such. I'd better end my song now, I've already said too much. For the less you say and the less you hear, the less you'll go astray. And the less you think and the less you do, the more you'll hear them say. Whatever you say, say nothing when you speak about you know. For if you know who should hear you, you know what you'll... They'll take you off to you know where, for you wouldn't know how. So for you know who's sick, don't let anyone hear you singing this. So for you know who's sick, don't let anyone hear you singing this song.